Ashanaya Ashanaya Himrityu Tanmano Kuruta Atman Visyamiti Sor Channa Charat Tasyarchata Apo Jayantaha Archate Vai Mekamabhuditi Tade Varkasyar Katvam Kang hava asmai bhavatiya Eva meta darkas yarkatvam veda Section 2 Agni Brahmana The Process of Creation Mantra 1 There was nothing whatsoever here in the beginning. It was covered only by death, Hiranyagarbha, or hunger, for hunger is death. He created the mind, thinking, let me have a mind. He moved about worshipping himself. As he was worshipping, water was produced. Since he thought, as I was worshipping, water sprang up, therefore arka, fire, is so called. Water or happiness surely comes to one who knows how Arka, fire, came to have the name of Arka. Now the origin of the fire that is fit for use in the horse sacrifice is being described. This story of its origin is meant as a eulogy in order to prescribe a meditation concerning it. There was nothing whatsoever differentiated by name and form here in the universe in the beginning that is, before the manifestation of the mind, etc. Question. Was it altogether void? Nihilistic view. It must be so, for the Shruti says, there was nothing whatsoever here. There was neither cause nor effect. Another reason for this conclusion is the fact of origin. A jar, for instance, is produced, Hence, before its origin, it must have been non-existent. The logician objects. But the cause cannot be non-existent, for we see the lump of clay, for instance, before the jar is produced. What is not perceived may well be non-existent, as in the case with the effect here, but not so with regard to the cause, for it is perceived. The nihilist. No, for before the origin nothing is perceived. If the non-perception of a thing be the ground of its non-existence, before the origin of the whole universe neither cause nor effect is perceived. Hence everything must have been non-existent. Vedantin's reply. Not so, for the Shruti says it was covered only by death. Had there been absolutely nothing either to cover or to be covered, the Shruti would not have said it was covered by death. For it never happens that a barren woman's son is covered with flowers springing from the sky. Yet the Shruti says it was covered only by death. Therefore, on the authority of the Shruti, we conclude that the cause which covered and the effect which was covered were both existent before the origin of the universe. Inference also points to this conclusion. We can infer the existence of the cause and effect before creation. We observe that a positive effect which is produced takes place only when there is a cause and does not take place when there is no cause. 
From this we infer that the cause of the universe, too, must have existed before creation, as is the case with the cause of a jar, for instance. Objection. The cause of a jar also does not pre-exist, for the jar is not produced without destroying the lump of clay, and so with other things. Reply. Not so, for the clay or other material is the cause. The clay is the cause of the jar and the gold of the necklace, and not the particular lump-like form of the material, for they exist without it. We see that effects such as the jar and the necklace are produced simply when their materials, clay and gold, are present, although the lump-like form may be absent. Therefore, this particular form is not the cause of the jar and the necklace, but when the clay and the gold are absent, the jar and the necklace are not produced, which shows that these materials, clay and gold, are the cause, and not the roundish form. Whenever a cause produces an effect, it does so by destroying another effect it produced just before, for the same cause cannot produce more than one effect at a time. But the cause, by destroying the previous effect, does not destroy itself. Therefore, the fact that an effect is produced by destroying the previous effect, the lump, for instance, is not a valid reason to disprove that the cause exists before the effect is produced. Namaste. So, back to philosophy 101. <laughs> what is cause and effect? And the underlying question there is, why does anything exist at all? And everybody is afraid of death. Everybody is afraid of the void, emptiness, shunyata. And yet, we need it. We enter the void every night in deep sleep. And if we don't get it, sleep researchers have found, we go nuts <laughs> after a couple of weeks. So these two questions are deeply intertwined because in Sushupti, we don't experience anything. Uh, like it says in the beginning, there was nothing. But there's that one word in the beginning, there was nothing here. What is this thing here? Uh, it turns out it's space itself. Without space and time, nothing can exist. This is why Shankaracharya uses the example of the pot. Okay? And so first we're going to look at a parallel a scriptural passage, and then we're going to go into the four kinds of cause. And then we're going to see how they apply in this instance. Text 94. After creating millions of universes, the first Purusha entered into each of them in a separate form as Sri Garbhodakashayi, Vishnu. 95. Entering the universe, he found only darkness with no place in which to reside. Thus he began to consider. Text 96. Then he created water from the perspiration of his own body and with that water filled half the universe. Text 97. The universe measures 500 million yojanas. Its length and breadth are one and the same. Text 98. After filling half the universe with water, he made his own residence therein and manifested the 14 worlds in the other half. I think this is from Vishnu Purana as paraphrased in Chaitanya Charitamrita. So why is there anything? Well, First of all, there has to be somebody to perceive the existence or non-existence of everything, okay? Someone who already exists. See, this is where the Buddhists, so-called Buddhists, miss the point, and where Buddha got the point, <laughs> but they don't get it, that Okay, you have nothingness, emptiness, shunyata, sushupti. But who is perceiving emptiness? Who or what? 
So we have to uh, go back to the beginning and, you know, look at the mantra closely. What does it say? There was nothing whatsoever here in the beginning. Nothing whatsoever here. Where is here? Well, here is space and time. Just blank, empty space and time. Huh? And the Purusha, who is, you know, the only active character here, is looking at this and going, well, I need to do something. I need to make something. Now, isn't that the case? Isn't that the way we all feel when we go into meditation and we encounter the void? It certainly was how I felt in the beginning. But then gradually I come to see the void as the ultimate refuge. There is nothing. So nothing can happen. That means nothing bad can happen. Huh? Because when we look at material existence, how can I say, Ob objectively, I don't like to use that word, uh, fairly, uh, when we characterize our existence, we have to admit that bad things outnumber the good. The goodness, enjoyment, pleasure, truth, uh, and so on, are rare. That's why they're valuable. That's why someone who knows the truth doesn't, you know, count this material world as very much. Well, because it's all temporary. Constantly changing. And that's not what we want. That's not what f nurtures and, and feeds us. See, we want emptiness. We want things that don't change. We want certainty. We want knowledge of who we are without any foreign outside influence. But then we find... <laughs> That in emptiness, we cannot really constate our existence. In other words, we cannot assert that we exist if we have no evidence other than our direct perception. So we make something. Isn't it? Is that the way it is with life? That's the way it is with everything. So here in the beginning, the Purusha or Vishnu or um, Jagrat, or uh, Virat, or whatever you want to call him, comes into the universe, and there's nothing going on. So he has to make something happen. So what does he do? He wanders around worshiping himself. This is how religion starts, see? This is how yoga and spiritual life and all this stuff starts. From the effort of the Supreme Purusha to create somewhere to live in the universe. And, you know, as a wandering monk, <laughs> uh, I sometimes get preoccupied with the search for a nice place to live because it's so rare in this world to find any place that's like far enough away from the noise and passion of life that you can even think straight. So, you know, unless you want to stay out in the forest all by yourself, uh, the only option then is to be part of some community that has similar values. And that's why we live in a temple. But anyway, there are four kinds of causes in any cause and effect situation. There's the material cause, which in the case of the pot is the clay. The nihilist says, there's clay, but it's just a lump of clay. There's no pot, uh, so the pot doesn't exist. In other words, the pot, when the clay is just in the ground, in the lump, does not exist. But according to causal analysis, it does exist. Why? Because there's not only clay, there's a potter. And the potter's intention is, I'm going to take this lump of clay and turn it into a pot. This is the efficient cause. So the clay is the material cause, but the potter is the efficient cause. 
And now he's going to put the thing on the wheel. And what happens? Poof, the lump disappears. And in a few minutes of work, the pot appears. So try to understand. The clay is the same. Whether it's in a lump or it's in a pot, only the outward form is different. In other words, the material cause is the same. But the efficient cause acts upon it to destroy the previous form and create a new one for which we have a different name. Why? Because the final cause, the fourth kind of cause, is the use or function of the new thing created. So in our case, we want a pot, which is going to be able to hold things. It's a container. We want a jar. So we put the clay through some changes, and now it has a new function it didn't have before. This is the cause, the efficient cause, destroying and then recreating the material cause into a new effect described by Shankar in the purport. So how does this apply to the universe? Well, in the beginning, nothing perceptible existed. Only the imperceivable. That's why it's called death. And the hunger is for something to have, uh, some place, a location, somewhere to be. A habitation. So we betake ourselves to worship. And this is what Vishnu did, the Purusha, in the beginning of the universe. He roamed about worshiping himself. And from his perspiration, the water was created. And from the water, fire. Huh? Well, it took the fire of his body perspiring to create the water. So this is how fire gets its name of arca, uh, like a plasma arc, torch. Arca means fire. It also means the sun. It's one of the names of the sun. So this uh, sun created water, just like we see on the earth today, that the sun evaporates water vapor from the sea and creates rain over the land. We had a beautiful rain last night. Now it's nice and cool. So this fire is necessary for everything in the material world and necessary for life. And where does it come from? The Purusha, from his hunger, his desire to create the world. Om Tat Sat. Om Shakti Om. Aum Namah Shivaya.